Here in the open ocean, graceful dolphins glide beneath the surface in pursuit of fish, their primary food. These fish, in turn, feed on minute, prolific creatures called zooplankton. These days, zooplankton share the surface waters with increasing numbers of minute plastic particles, posing a problem since fish and birds are now consuming plastic in addition to plankton. Since petroleum-based plastics are non-biodegradable, any plastic entering the ocean remains there, continually breaking into ever smaller pieces until it becomes ingested or is deposited on some distant shore. Captain Charles Moore of the Algalita Marine Research Foundation is conducting experiments to better understand the threat posed by this global environmental catastrophe. Okay, let's do it. As captain of the oceanographic research vessel Algita, I've traveled to many remote areas of the Pacific Ocean. And in my travels, I've been alarmed at the increase in the amount of trash, plastic debris on all the beaches that I visit. My sentiment was that the ocean is filling up with trash. To try to get a handle on the quantity of trash in the ocean, uh, we devised a series of experiments using uh, mantatrol and our technique of pairing the mass of zooplankton to the mass of plastic fragments. We trawled over 100 kilometers at random lengths and then came back to the lab and analyzed our samples. We compared the weight of the plastic pieces that we accumulated in these trawls to the weight of the zooplankton that we accumulated. And most people find it highly distressing to learn that for every six pounds of plastic that we got, there was only one pound of plankton. In other words, there's six times more plastic by weight in this area than there is naturally occurring plankton. But that was a decade ago. New scientific trawls by Algalita as recently as 2008 recorded an average of about 45 to 1 in the same region known as the Northeast Pacific Gyre. The alarming increase is demonstrated by this sample choked with toxic plastic fragments. As you can see in this sample, the plastic recovered has been reduced to severely degraded chips. This is due to photodegradation and the loss of plasticizers. In our study, we counted over 27,000 pieces of plastic, and out of that 27,000, only 83 were tan. Now, we know from the large pieces of debris that we collected that there's plenty of tan objects that are breaking down to form plastic fragments but we believe that the tan pieces are being selectively removed by birds and other uh, plankton feeders because they resemble the krill. So color is important as a food mimic, also shape. The nurdles themselves have an oval shape that resembles fish eggs and are preferentially eaten by many species of birds. Over 70 species of birds have been found to ingest these pre-consumer plastics. Studies have been done on birds that have found higher PCB content in their tissues when they've ingested plastic. So we know this plastic is a way to transport pollution. Japanese scientists were the first to identify plastic pellets as sponges for legacy pollutants like PCBs and DDT, which concentrate them up to a million times their levels in the surrounding seawater. They then showed that when ingested, the pollutants were transferred from the pellets to the living tissue of marine creatures. Windrow cells are convergent zones of floating objects and contain both natural and synthetic debris. 
Windrows are one of the most recognizable near-surface mixing dynamics in the world ocean. Also called drift lines, windrows have been traditional foraging zones for sea creatures over the millennia of evolution. Here, fishes and crustaceans like crabs hide in the debris, attracting predators. Today, drift lines also contain toxic synthetic fragments. These mimic traditional food due to size and color. Windrows are a primary point where endocrine disrupting synthetics enter the ocean's food chain. Nowadays, plastic dust is also employed in manufacturing plastic products. These dust particles escape factories and are so small that ocean creatures ingest them just by swimming through the water column. The smaller the fragments, the less of them are found, perhaps indicating that filter feeders and small organisms had collected them. If so, synthetic dust would severely impact the very foundation of the ocean's food web. The Laysan albatross and the black-footed albatross ingest post-consumer plastic and the laysan albatross ingests gliders and light sticks and large plastic fragments. One of the problems you have as far as when the, the adult brings the plastic and regurgitates it into the chick, uh, if the chick is not receiving enough nutrients, enough uh, food, uh, and this plastic is basically filling the void in the stomach, essentially it could die. What you see in here is basically it's a, a bottle cap to some might have been a shampoo bottle or something of that nature. Another bottle cap. This looks like an electric uh, wire plug. According to Dr. Anthony Andrade, an expert in the breakdown of plastics in the marine environment, every piece of plastic ever manufactured still exists. Uh, the molecular weight of a molecule, a single molecule of plastic, these long chain polymers are so heavy and so rigid that there's no organism, no bioengineered bacteria, nothing that can break them down. That's why there's no such thing as biodegradation of petroleum-based manufactured plastic. The bonds between the building blocks of these synthetic polymers are so resistant that not even bioengineered bacteria can break them down. Individual plastic molecules must themselves decay before they biodegrade. And this process is very slow in soil, but slower yet in the ocean, perhaps taking centuries. Algalita scientists have recently published the results of a study of 671 lanternfish night feeders at the surface that are the most common fish in the Central Pacific. 35% were found to have ingested plastic particles, and some had large numbers of plastic chips in their stomachs. These fish, in turn, are eaten by seals, dolphins, tunas, and mahi-mahi, thereby transferring their pollutant load. So what we've got to do is change the way we produce and consume plastics. If all the plastic ever made still exists, we've got to invent a kind of plastic that won't be around forever. Just absolutely gross. It's a truly disgusting plastic cesspool uh, that uh, has to be uh, burned into the consciousness of humanity that the ocean is now a plastic wasteland. 